This week, the luxury channel is in India, one of the world's fastest developing markets. We'll be finding out what makes Indian craftsmanship so desirable to Western fashion houses. We'll be talking to some of India's hottest young designers. We'll also be visiting the IHT Sustainable Luxury Conference to find out what responsibility and sustainability have to do with luxury. Happy, out of control, inexplicable, uh, and uh, sometimes a mysterious uh, country. India is very passionate. It is uh, very dirty, and it has pockets which are sublime. I would not live anywhere else. India is really hot right now, and I think that's giving all of India an incredible sense of pride to be Indian, to be to be born Indian, and I think also to start buying Indian. And also, I think, as one of the most important emerging um, powers in the world today, I think an incredible sense of responsibility as well, because uh, we really we can't let the world down. India has always been steeped in a sense of luxury, and some believe luxury was invented here. India produces some of the finest textiles to be found anywhere in the world. And today, luxury brands are trying to expand in this emerging market. The cultural heritage of India and its vast workforce make it a perfect place for Western brands to produce handmade goods at the highest level. In this program, we'll be talking to the leading voices of the luxury goods and fashion industry, all of whom are taking the responsibility of sustainable luxury seriously. Here at the Imperial Hotel in New Delhi, the leading lights of the world fashion and luxury industry have gathered to discuss India's potential as an emerging luxury market. But they are all too aware that to succeed in this complex market, they must overcome some major challenges. I can't think of a better moment to bring this conference to India. Luxury was invented in India. I mean, the jewelry, the palaces, the opulence, the grandeur, the style, the idiosyncrasies of the Indian Maharajas and the Indian royalty, they really epitomized glamour and an incredible sense of opulence, which I still can't find anywhere else. The International Herald Tribune wanted to get a lot of different kind of people talking about this subject of sustainable luxury. Sustainability is the buzzword on everybody's lips. But what exactly does it mean? It really means two things. It means what India is all about, a deep culture, things that last, things which are about emotions, which is what luxury is so much about now. To me, sustainable luxury is something which transcends time, taste and fashion, something that, that I'm going to love over a long period of time. Objects of beauty, which I'm going to love and sort of have an affair with for the rest of my life. But also, of course, we're all thinking about how to sustain luxury in this difficult financial climate. It's a very odd thing, sustainability. I mean, for a long time, a lot of companies have sort of used it interchangeably with the word eco or green. Yet, of course, the debate's far wider. There's the economic aspect of it, the social and the environmental. And obviously, what you're looking for is a balance of those three. As the issue gains momentum in the popular press, so too the public awareness of it is peaking. And even in the midst of a global recession, many consumers around the world are placing sustainability at the top of the agenda. Despite the, the, the dazzle of the economic crisis, um, they still recognise that there are sort of longer term issues that maybe sustainability can help us address. It looks as if consumers, in many cases, even though they can't quite quantify how it's going to work, feel that sustainability may be the route out of this problem. Luxury good does not fit immediately with sustainability. Uh, we have to work for that. L sustainability and luxury have to work together. India is really one of the originators of the concept of luxury. 
Internationally, when people think of Indian design, they think of the sumptuousness. India has always been associated with luxury. It's always been associated with splendor and magnificence and artistry and quality. I think people succumb very naturally to Indian taste and Indian style. And it's a very seductive, seductive culture today. What's unique about India is the heritage which you could find. It, it, it's absolutely unique. The, the, there is a civilization, there is a culture, a rich culture, a culture where luxury have had its roots. Needless to say, our textiles, our brilliant craftsmanship, our choice of colors, our embroidery, we excel at it. Indian textiles have always been admired. India really devised the technology for, for color-resist dye. They have a unique taste for textile. They have a capacity to, to do beautiful things, which is incredible. I think India has always been a culture where things have been customized and custom-made, and that's very much part of the concept of luxury. It's not about large production. It is still possible to purchase items of great beauty, handmade in India without breaking the bank. Tapping into the extraordinary sense of colour and craftsmanship that exists in India is a great way to sustain luxury and capture the market. And it is no secret that some of the biggest names in luxury get their embroideries done in India. They just don't tell the world about it. In the heart of Jodhpur is Maharani Art Exporters, where many famous luxury houses go to create pieces which will be found in many leading department stores around the world. We got 8,600 craft people. They work for our company on an everyday basis and they get trained by our company how to make the Western scale of the world. You know how the designers are, they're very precise. They need everything to be done perfect in the certain way, the best and perfect. So we have to make sure the quality of the product has to be very neat, very clean. Here you can find a one-of-a-kind piece where all the work is done by hand, using tools and methods that have changed little over thousands of years. This piece, for example, would have taken six to seven years to produce, with all of the stitching done using a single goat hair instead of a needle. A craftsman would only make one of these in their lifetime, and at retail, it could fetch up to $8,000 in the West. We give them good pay, and then they get also a lot of social securities and things like that. You know, they get very good benefits working with our company. I always say when, when people ask me what's your favorite garment, I think for me the most perfect thing is a sari. A stretch of seven meter of fabric and you just wrap it, but it becomes the most graceful uh, garment. People don't wear whatever they wear just for some tourists to come and take photographs. There's a reason for everything there. The Indian women will still wear their saris no matter what, and thank God for that. I think Indian glamour is it's really super glamorous. I mean, you know, when you're glamorous in India, you're really glamorous. The way the people, the way people live and the way people spend money, uh, the kind of jewelry that Indian women wear, I've not seen anywhere else in the world. And it's not just Indian designers who are drawing influence from this beautiful country. For the last 20 years, some of the biggest Western brands have been coming to India to utilize the astonishing level of craftsmanship found here and to draw inspiration from the country's rich cultural heritage. Two such brands who have dedicated themselves to this country are Hermes and Dries van Noten, both of whom have developed a unique bond with India. India for Hermes, uh, it is a very special relationship. It is a very old relationship. I like to say it's a sort of love affair. There is something with India which connects very well with my aesthetic and, and my, my vision on a lot of things. Someone like Dries van Noten, who's worked with India for 20 years, really a testament to what can be achieved in this country. Indian craftsmanship and textiles have been an integral part of Dries van Noten's philosophy since his company's inception in the 1980s. And today the two worlds are intrinsically linked. I started my own company in 86 and then from 88 on I started to work together with Indian manufacturers to make some embroideries. So little by little um, I tried to push embroideries in a different direction. 
So I think together with my manufacturers, we, we achieved really something. I always say that I teach them, uh, but even more they teach us in Belgium how to look at things and what is possible and all these things. So in that way I really love to work together with India. We consider India, first of all, and before anything else, as a source of inspiration. A few years ago, uh, Jean-Louis Dumas, who gave to Hermès uh, the strength that we know today, had the very interesting idea uh, to send 25 or 30 artisans of Hermès from every part of Hermès to the Tar desert in Rajasthan. And um, in that desert, at the edge of the desert, in tents, they invited artisans of India. And they had a long exchange during two weeks to discuss ways to, do, to observe, discuss, exchange. And we keep doing it. It's not a one-way attitude, it's a two-way attitude. Hermes has made a year of India last 2008. And year of India means that in every window of the 400 stores of Hermes, you had India design. Uh, elephants, India, under uh, all aspects. We gave space, freedom to the creators of the windows to express India as they loved. Coming up later, this program discovers what it means to do business in India today and learns about the challenges facing brands that want to do business in India. Earlier in the program, the Luxury Channel discovered what sustainable luxury means. We also found out how the cultural heritage of India and its vast workforce makes it the perfect place for luxury brands to come to make handmade goods at the highest level. Over the next two decades, the country's middle class is expected to grow from about 5% of the population to more than 40%, creating in the process the world's fifth largest consumer market. But will this boom of new millionaires be enough to make India the next luxury retail destination? And who is India's luxury consumer today? Anybody who's interested in India, anybody who's interested in doing business with India, really needs to come and spend a lot of time understanding Indians and what the Indian mentality is. I think the Indian consumer is probably the most difficult mind to crack. We are 26 different states, we are 26 different Indias, we are probably 50 different dialects and you will find honestly each customer has a completely different need, has a different desire, has a different taste level. We are not one homogeneous society, you know. We're such emotional people that everything for us comes with an emotional connect. There's an emotional journey that makes everything special for us. There is, there is kind of a born elegance. There is already their own culture and their own, their own identity, which is so strong. The Indian woman, her relationship with fashion is quite different from that of women from the rest of the world. She's intelligent, she does not take brands for granted, and she seeks value from, for them. The very high end, the high spends that happen, happen around, around weddings and around uh, big celebrations. The big fat Indian wedding has a very important role to play in our choice of wardrobe. Every Indian woman will have a certain part of a wardrobe that is separately kept aside for big occasions, for big weddings, and that's where she will go out and spend and she will see value in spending on that sari. Simultaneously, the same Indian woman will have another wardrobe for bereavement. She will have another wardrobe for when she meets her boyfriend's parents. She will have a separate wardrobe for when she goes to work. And you'll see all of that coexisting merrily in her wardrobe. And she kind of steps into each one and just slips into that role automatically. That is what drives the notion of buying in India. I think people need to be blessed by the elders in the family uploaded by people of their age and also by in such a fashion that you can gift it to your children. It's about heritage. Indians value traditions, they value heritage, they value family ties. 
So what their great grandfathers or their ancestors taught them, it carries on. You really can't just seduce her with any pretty bag and expect her to buy it. You can't take her for granted. She is somebody who exactly knows what she wants to buy and what she wants that purchase to do for her. I think India's newfound wealth and prosperity has made affluent Indians very, very confident. So it's not a slavish consumption of things from the West. It's a very dis discerning or discriminating consumption from the West and from the East. Indians like to spend money and because of which you've got a lot of these brands now coming into the country and the Indian shopper, he's clever, I mean he's looking for deals but having said that I think they're now learning to buy something that looks good on them. You're not just buying a product for the brand or the label. That's the change I think that's happened over the last five years. It's uh, an experience that I don't see uh, fading out. It's Indians love to shop. The big question is how big is the Indian market? And I think nobody really knows that. The Indian consumers have been buying Western luxury brands and continue to buy Western luxury brands, uh, but they buy most of it outside of India. Wealthy Indian shoppers have long preferred to buy their designer handbags, sunglasses, clothing and shoes abroad, avoiding Indian import duties of up to 45%, which is another impediment to growth. So what we have to do is firstly convert and have them feel comfortable and confident about buying the products locally. There are also some cultural hurdles for the Western brands to navigate. With 75% of all spending still being on traditional garments such as the sari, India is still a tough market to penetrate. But one company is hoping that this is about to change. Welcome to Emporio, India's newest and largest shopping mall. With over 200 stores, it is India's premier site for retail therapy. That India is ready for luxury brands, India is ready for an international luxury mall. Housing all the biggest names from the West, alongside homegrown Indian talent, the mall aims to represent the very best of fashion in India. What you see in the mall is a representation of how we are as Indians. I mean, in Indian culture, we carry the Western as much as the Indian. So the mall is simply a representation of how we all live, you know. Everyone felt that it was an idea before its time, you know. Um, we, on the other hand, were convinced that it was an idea whose time was going to come and it was all going to come together, you know. And being in the real estate business, we understand you, you have to be patient and you have to wait it out, you know. Even though economies are still growing, middle class is expanding and fashion consciousness rising, with so many other social concerns, is India really in a position to start going green? In the heart of New Delhi is the Park Hotel. The park is run by the Apogee Group, whose group of hotels in India focus on relevant social issues and tries to nurture art and culture from each region. But what really puts the Park Hotel on the map is its award-winning restaurant, Fire. From the food part, there's been a lot of movement towards organic food and when we did the uh, restaurant Fire, we uh, decided to put a section of um, organic um, you know, lentils and fresh vegetables and other things in an effort just to put it on the menu so that people actually get aware of it. Five years back when Priya Paul uh, mentioned about organic food to be brought on the menu, I initially thought that, you see, it's one of those fads which has come and it's going to go away. But slowly when I started studying organic food and how it is done and got into more details, I realized that, you see, this is the way to go. We have now translated all our lentils that we cook here, those are organic. All the vegetables that are on the menu are completely organic. The stunning Devigar Palace, which was built in the 18th century and is now a world-class luxury resort, is a perfect example of what businesses can achieve when issues of sustainability and ethical employment are placed at the front and centre of an innovative business plan. Amazingly, this building was abandoned in the 1970s when the princely states merged to form the Union of India. With the Maharajas unable to sustain their beautiful palaces, many of them, including this one, fell into ruin. It was bought for a song in the 90s by the industrialist Podar family, with the intention of turning it into a world-class resort. 
But what makes this hotel so singular is its relationship with the villages that surround it. At the Devagar Palace Hotel, there is little separation between five-star luxury travel and humble Indian village life. Almost 50 to 60 percent of our present employees are from the surrounding villages or the main village. We do camel rides, horse rides, pottery. There is an NGO whom we are very much actively involved in uplifting of the life of the villages. Providing them training which will give them jobs, whether it is in accounts, whether it is in horticulture, whether it is in engineering department. Businesses like this are essential to sustainable growth in India. By restoring beautiful buildings to their former glory and harnessing the benefits that come from tourism to help small villages, these companies are not only allowing us to travel in style, but also with a clear conscience. The last stop on our journey is Ambi Valley, located within easy reach of India's commercial capital, Mumbai. Ambi Valley, spread over 10,000 acres of land, is about providing a healthy living environment to those who seek urban proximity. This lifestyle project has devoted nearly 91% of its land to greenery, open space and water bodies. It has also organised a reforestation programme and a number of renewable energy resource programmes, such as solar, wind and waste to energy conversion in an attempt to create a pollution-free environment. Ambi Valley also provides employment and training to more than a thousand villagers and is involved in the reconstruction of schools and provision of drinking water in the neighbouring villages. It is on its way to becoming the first sustainable private city of its kind and its developers are proud to be part of the growing number of corporates who are aware of their larger social responsibility. So there you have it. We have spoken to some of the leading authorities on the subjects of fashion, luxury and sustainable development. But what does the future hold? Is a truly sustainable luxury industry even possible? I think there is a lot of hope because I think people want a solution and they want to give themselves as part of the solution. They want to do something. They just don't know what to do. And they're looking for guidance from brands in order to do that. All of us need to wake up and realize that this has to go way beyond a trend. It is changing the entire system. I see even in the basic products that more and more people look at the label. And if the label doesn't say where it comes from, they maybe leave it aside. Because it's easy also to put sometimes the Made in Italy tag. Who knows where it's made? I think it's a high time that we discuss these issues. We don't have an option. We, in fact, we need to be militant about it. Maybe we have few things to teach there because it's part of our system. And maybe we have few things to learn because in this whole speed of globalization, we've forgotten them. See, in this world where we are, um, we are so high on fashion and trends and things like that, longevity is an issue. They need you to overconsume and they need you to uh, renew their wardrobe every six months. But I think the consumer has to address this. I think it has to come from the consumers. Anything which doesn't address sustainability is obsolete now. I think it's a great opportunity for the world to question ourselves what's good to be, what's good for us, and what's good for our children. I think it's all this ethos of a developed country where everything matters. You know, here the guy on the street doesn't know where his next meal is coming from, and you're talking about an ethically produced shirt. It's not a priority. We are a very proud country and a proud nation and proud individuals. But at the same time, where it comes to business, at the end of the day, we will follow an instruction if it comes from the West. So I'd really feel that companies with so much power, I think they need to do their bit. Many brands, many manufacturers do get involved in education of families, kids, villages, because you know, if you educate the kids, they're gonna come up with better production techniques, better qualities, better hygiene levels. So there has been a concerted effort to make this happen. Of course, media needs to play a very, very big role in educating the consumers, in educating everybody, and trying to do their bit. People today are not rejecting brands. 
they are rejecting the brands that are not uh, authentic and that uh, they feel they have been uh, betrayed by certain brands. So it's an entire system that needs to come together and work and everybody has a very important role to play. The luxury world cannot live in a bubble. We are not uh, isolated. We live in the world. Some in the luxury world seems to have forgotten that. Luxury brands are very good at selling an experience. And sustainability arguably is, is about an experience. It's about the experience you have as a consumer when you buy something to understand that the outcomes of your purchase affect a whole range of people.